Well, I thank you all for coming to literally the last session of the last day of scale. You must all be... <laughs> yes, this, this may actually be the best session, if for no other reason. While the title says failure is half the fun of success, the real answer is this is the John Hawley story hour. It's where... <laughs> where I'm basically going to tell you everything I've ever seen done wrong and how it all ended up probably for the best in the long run. <laughs> so I gave this talk um, a few months ago down in Guadalajara, actually, and I really had the intention of uh, going down there and talking to them about uh, that it was actually okay to fail. You know, it, we, you know, even up here and, you know, everywhere, we have this perception that um, failure is like the ultimate f thing that we can do wrong, and that it, you know once we've failed, it's just the end of the world. You know, everyone hates me. You know, you might as well throw everything in the trash. And um, the reality is, is that's not actually true. You know, failure is, you know, it, failure is a step in a process. It is um, the only reason that you would actually genuinely fail is if you stop the process. Um, you know, when we, when we fail, what we need to do, what we really need to learn and what we need to do is uh, learn to keep going, learn to figure out why you failed, what went wrong, what you can do better next time, or just quite literally how you can fix what's already broken. And in some cases, you know, and most of this talk is just going to be about, you know, things that have gone wrong that, or that I've seen gone wrong before. And that, no, it's okay for you to fail as well, because I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, it's all good. So case in point, uh, up there on the screen, I've got a little robot that uh, I, uh, I ended up building a few years, years ago. Um, you can't quite see it because uh, the room's a little washed out and I did not think to actually lighten my slide, which is hilarious because, you know, I uh, mentioned that to someone this morning <laughs> as one of the failures of uh, projectors. But, um, what, you know, one of the things that uh, that I did with this robot was I had never built a robot before. You know, I was a, a low le I'm a low-level systems programmer uh, by trade, and uh, I had never built a robot. And I decided I'm just going to build K9 from Doctor Who. And uh, you know, I, I I didn't think about this too much, and I just started plowing straight in. To say that I bit off more than I could chew was a bit of an understatement. And uh, started with a box of parts. And, God, you really can't see. Is there any way we can dim some of the lights? <laughs> Cause this, I mean, I know for the folks who are you know, going to be on the video stream, this is going to look fantastic. But um, those of you here in the room, you can't even tell how, uh, how ridiculously jumbled. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to work. You know what? The slides will be online. If you want to come look at them afterwards, fine. I'm just going <laughs> to talk to them anyway. But I ordered a pile of parts. You know, I had this vague idea of what I wanted to build, and I went ahead and bought up hundreds of dollars worth of parts and just went, great, I'm going to start slapping things together and we'll see what sticks. And then I opened up the box of parts and went, holy shit, what the hell have I gotten myself into? And slowly but surely, I started putting those parts together, testing what was going on. I did not actually chop that in half with my chop saw, thankfully. Um, but everything was a trial and error process. You know, I knew that I um, wasn't quite sure what was going on. I didn't know exactly how all of these pieces were going to go together. And in fact, you know, for things like these uh, tank treads that I was using, there wasn't even good documentation. Because, uh, you know, to do up tank treads, well, you know, you're, they're going to go around a, a couple of wheels, and you would think that they would give you ideas of what the spacing should be between uh, e each piece of the... Uh, um, the cogs and whatnot. Well, they didn't. So you had two choices. One, you could try and figure out the math, which is actually slightly more complex than you would think, or you could just start drilling holes and hope that you get it right. I chose option two, <laughs> unsurprisingly. And I just started building things. And I did not get it right on the first try. I did not get it right on the second try. I did not get it right on the fifth try. The sixth try you know, after you've, you know, built your castles one on top of each other in a swamp, it stood! <laughs> it's, it, it actually worked. And um, I actually got a mostly working robot. 
And uh, this is uh, chassis version number six, actually. This is exactly chassis number version six. And as you can see, there's a whole pile of wires, and there's this computer involved, and then I burnt out the computer that was running the whole thing. So even though I had made it, you know, oh so far, built a robot, it still failed. And, you know, after you've, you know, spent all this time building this chassis, you burn out a robot, you go, y your options are you can either laugh, you can cry, and, or, and, or you can laugh and uh, move on, or you can cry and give up. And unsurprisingly, I just laughed it off, accepted that, uh, it, uh, that I had failed, or that I had had a problem, that I needed to fix it, changed some stuff out, and eventually got a fully working, you know, after substantially more trial and error, got a fully working robot that you know, has been around the world a couple of times now. The interesting problem with that uh, particular dog is uh, he was here at scale last year. He also caught fire <laughs> at scale last year. So I, I, I can't even say that he's been a resounding success after you know, constantly failing. He's currently in time out, in fact, because, uh, well, he didn't quite catch on that much fire. But... Uh, uh, there was a, a couple of wires that uh, you can't quite see it there, but they had rub rubbed up against each other in shipping, and eventually, after you know thousands of miles being handled by luggage monkeys at the airlines, shorted and caused a small electrical fire next to 17 amp hours of batteries. <laughs> so, um, but you know, even still, you know, he actually caught on fire the day before scale started. So I actually had one small saving grace in that I had time to fix him. An emergency run to fries and $300. Well, with Calchan, he's actually in the audience. He's pointing at himself. Uh, uh, was it $140 in parts or was it three? No, it was $140 in parts, give or take, um, including buying a new multimeter. Uh, <laughs> came back, wired him back up, and he was actually running around for the rest of the conference. And it's hard to, it, it's hard to claim that there hasn't been anything that hasn't failed on that particular robot. I mean, robots are one of those things where once you start building them, there is nothing that will ever work right on a robot. Robots are constantly broken. Be it's, you know, if you look up robot in the definition, the definition it's, you know, autonomous vehicle and or always broken. <laughs> and actually, I'm kind of curious, how many of you have actually built a robot? Anybody? Bueller? Okay, a couple of you. So, you know, I'm at least speaking to the crowd that the robots all, oh. No, killing the robot doesn't count. No, kids don't count. They're a little too autonomous. <laughs> and when they break, it's usually a little more dramatic than, you know, the dog catching on fire. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, so I'm kind of, you know, walking through you through this story is just saying, you know, look, step one in, in understanding what's going on in the world, just start biting off more than you can chew. Start looking at what's going on around the world and go, look, I just want to build a robot. And don't build, you know, a teeny tiny little robot. Build something or do something that's dramatically outside of your reach. Don't expect to actually succeed at it, but pick something that's dramatically outside of your reach. And I, I'm suggesting this for one simple fact, is that the more and faster you fail at what you're working on, the more you're going to learn. And the faster you're failing, the, more, the faster you're learning. And that's kind of what happened with this particular robot. But this is not the only instance of uh, uh, people failing and having to learn from uh, their mistakes. The dog, um, in its uh, first adventure, actually ended up going to Edinburgh uh, in Scotland uh, two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago. And it raced against uh, the Octo Blimp. And for those of you uh, who are watching this, um, uh, may know that Beth Flanagan was the operator of that particular blimp. It's, a, it's actually a very nice blimp um, at the end of the day. Uh, weighs substantially less than the dog, you know, flies around. And we decided to have a little bit of a bet that uh, the dog could uh, outrace the blimp or that the blimp could outrace the dog. Uh, Pidge's uh, belief was that the miracle of flight would by far outstrip anything that uh, some land-based silly dog thing could do. Well, she learned a very, very valuable lesson um, 
the day that uh, the, the race took place. As the blimp, as you can vaguely see in the, the uh, screenshot there, immediately careened out of control. So everybody's got, you know, I, I see a couple of laptops and I'm sure you guys have cell phones in the audience. Um, how are you getting network to those devices? You know, I, I, you're connected to the internet. How are you getting internet? Scales Wi-Fi. Wi what usually, not in the case of scale, thankfully, does not work at a conference, particularly a tech conference? The Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi. <laughs> Most conventions that you go to that are technical, people show up with anywhere between three and eight devices that will uh, be connected to the network. Um, there are some very large conferences uh, that happen in Vegas uh, that I know of that they plan on eight devices per person and they're still underestimating in most cases. Mostly because there's various people who then, you know, they pull out a laptop, two laptop, three laptop, five laptop, you know, two phones and half a dozen other things. But taunting the demo gods with Wi-Fi or networking in the general sense is always a bad idea. And so I, I, I diverge on this little rant about Wi-Fi for one very specific reason. What's the worst control protocol to use for your uh, drone at a conference? Wi-Fi. Wi <laughs> uh, Beth did not actually build um, most of the blimp. She uh, passed all of this work off to an intern. The intern thought that the most brilliant way to deal with the communications protocol between uh, for the control protocol for the, the, the blimp was to use a point-to-point -point wireless link. And, uh, you know, the, and d throughout the week uh, or, or several days before this race happened, you know, the blimp would be up and it'd be flying around and she can control it reasonably well without a whole lot of problems. But, at, uh, but you can kind of sit, well, as I nearly fall off the, uh, the stage, <laughs> that would have been a failure I could have talked about. Uh, <laughs> um, as you can see, there are several hundred people in this room now who have all pulled out their cell phones and are taking picture and video. When you wake a cell phone up, the first thing it does is it starts talking to the network. <laughs> so as soon as the race started, everybody whips out their phone and anything in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum became an unusable uh, mass. Thus the blimp careening off into control and nearly killing people. So, a, 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 an obvious lesson was learned or reminded of at that point, which is Wi-Fi is not a good control protocol when it's mission critical. And, you know, and um, what's interesting about that is that I, ha I made a similar de decision with the dog in that I needed a remote control protocol for the robot. And I had thought about this. Well, let's use Wi-Fi. No, wait a minute. Wi-Fi is a bad idea. Wi-Fi for control protocols on robots is always a bad idea, particularly if you actually intend to take it to a conference. So I chose something that made a little more sense, and, I, and the, that actually ended up being an Xbox 360 controller, because someone actually went through and did a ridiculous amount of um, planning to, for these controllers to work in an, a really nasty RF, or 2.4 gigahertz RF environment. They do spread spectrum, they bounce it uh, all over the channel map, but strangely enough, your Xbox 360 controller almost always absolutely works. It doesn't matter how messy the, the, the spectrum is. That's my backup controller for the dog. And it worked. <laughs> so, a lesson was learned. Problems were seen, lessons were learned. The blimp did not quite do that. Although we can't actually find the blimp now, so I can't entirely confirm that that may not have happened after the fact. But, um, yeah, things went wrong. We learned from them. Oh, that's what Wi-Fi looks like at a conference. I'm apparently, I should apparently be, like, tran you know, hitting my slides more often. I keep forgetting what's up here. Um, but, yeah, that, yeah, that's what Wi-Fi looks like at a conference. The bus is the blimp. So. Uh, I wasn't going to point that out, but, yes. Most uh, commercial drones that are available in the market use the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Some of them actually use directly Wi-Fi. <sighs> Please don't fly them at a conference. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just leave that there. Just don't, don't fly them at a conference. We don't need uh, 
We don't need that at conferences. Fire is bad. Just don't do it. And the helicopters do weigh substantially more. This is kind of, you know, another picture of the, the blimp careening off and nearly killing people. Although, speaking of drones, um, after the, uh, the incident with the, the blimp, I was effectively challenged by Pidge that, well, she participated in the miracle of flight, so technically she, run, she won the race. I contest that particular uh, uh, statement. And although our bet was that I got bragging rights for a year, two years later, or two and a half years later, I guess I'm still bragging about it. So yeah, I guess I've also broken that portion of the bet. But uh, so I said, screw that. Let's put them in a board and flight. And I started actually just taking a commercial off-the-shelf drone and bolting a minnow board to it and doing in-flight computer vision processing. So I actually had the minnow board feeding information back into an, uh, an existing flight computer. And this actually worked pretty well. And as you can see, that drone uh, that's down there is a pretty sizable drone. It's about, about yay big. Blades spin at several thousand RPM. Each one of them is about this long. So when things go wrong, they can go really, 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 really badly. Oh my god, you know, duck and cover, bad. And despite the fact that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've flown this for, you know, hundreds of hours and done uh, quite a number of things, I had one particular incident um, in the last year where it crashed. And it crashed pretty spectacularly. You know, it, it, um, there are two times in an, air, in an airframe's uh, existence that are the most dangerous uh, times in its life. Takeoff and landing. In this case, they were both the same thing. <laughs> During takeoff, uh, one of the rotors flew off, literally, uh, from the airframe, uh, at which point the, the entire airframe became unbalanced. And instead of you know, throttling up and, uh, uh, and letting everything stabilize, I did the incredibly smart thing of cutting all the power. So it's about this far off the ground. I cut all the power. It then falls immediately. Everything rolls, and you know, half the blades all break off. So again, more failures. But the drone's back up and running. I didn't stop, or I, I, I didn't, I, I haven't stopped flying it. But, uh, you know, yes, everything, you know, drones are for, one, you know, basically two purposes. One, you fly them to take video to post on YouTube. And two, to break so that you fix them. Those are the only two real uses for drones, as far as I can tell. Anybody drone flyer? You don't count. You bought the one I told you to buy, though. <laughs> so, and sometimes there there are just things in the world that you just don't want to screw up. How many people here have commit access to repositories or run large rate arrays? A few of you. Have you ever thought about the miracle? of what happens to get from when you hit the save button on something or the commit button to that, those bits actually ending up on a hard drive and then the ability to pull that all back out in the same order in which they were put in. If you're a storage person, this, is what keep, this entire idea is what keeps you up at night because this shouldn't work. <laughs> there are so many moving pieces. There are so many uh, points of failure in this whole thing that it just honestly should not work. And, and, and then you start thinking about, you know, multi-disc arrays and, you know, petabytes of disk, and, you know, most people curl up under the chair and cry because it's just mind-boggling. So how many of you have actually pushed a commit that deleted everything? Oh. <laughs> Apparently Gen 2 has deleted everything at least once. Or how many of you have accidentally hit RM minus RF on something that's like the most precious thing possible? Yeah. Backups are great, aren't they? And this is the point where... <laughs> I'm sorry? Alias. A a alias. Yeah. Oh, RM. Oh, alias to RM minus RF. Oh. Yeah, aliases are yeah bad. Yeah. And they're done that. Undid that alias. <laughs> So, um, yeah, storage is one of those things where everybody, you, 
everybody depends on it. Everybody absolutely depends on it. But, ev but it is one of the most fragile things in the world. And if you look around, there are stories everywhere of somebody accidentally screwing everything up. In fact, there's um, some stories from the Google Summer of Code students um, there's actually a, a fantastic story from one of the Python students. I don't think it was, I think it was last year or the year before. I don't, was it last year? Where, you know, they, they had been working on their code. They had been doing all of these really great things. They had, fi you know, the, the project had finally given them full commit access to the repository. And the first thing they pushed completely trashed the entire repository history from end to end. <laughs> and and the, the, the student unsurprisingly was mortified. They, you know, the first time anybody had ever trusted them and they had utterly failed. And, you know, they then went immediately fessed up to it and they are, by the time they had even talked to their, the rest of their project, they had a, a, a plan on how, they, how it was all going to get fixed. They actually went through the entire process, fixed the repository back to a, a, a completely good state and they moved on with life. And if you think about this, most students, I mean, Google Summer of Code that is all students in uh, college. These are, you know, a lot of, um, you know, folks who have never even had to deal with source control, let alone been given enough uh, uh, control, you know, control or uh, responsibility to, to push something that is, you know, used by hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, to be given all of this in one go and to screw it up, you know, most people would immediately curl up into a ball under a table and, net, you know, they... they they'd go and become the hermits that, you know, s st you know sit in the, the, the watchtowers for forests and never touch a computer again um, by screwing up like this. But the student, you know, my hat goes off to them. They not only, you know, did all, you know, screwed up, fix, uh, you know, had a plan uh, for fixing it by the time they um, uh, let anybody know, fixed it, but then they had the um, brilliance to write a blog post about what happened. So they, they not only fessed up to it, they told everyone what they did, and they shared their story. And, you know, of all the things in the world, that's probably one of the most courageous things I've ever seen, is just admitting, I effed up on such an epic level, and yet I want to tell everybody, it's okay. They didn't get in trouble, you know, they had a plan, they fixed it. Screwing up is okay. Screwing up and not fixing it or completely walking away, that's when failure actually happens. It is not the act of, you know, the, the, the screw up itself, running RM minus RF, crashing um, a, a drone. It's the act, you know, failure is when you screw up and you don't try to fix it. You can't figure out how to fix it. You give up. And, you know, some, uh, uh, to some extent, th this is what this talk is about, is screwing up is okay. We all do it. We've all done it. Some of us substantially more than others. Me. <laughs> um, if you know my background at all, I had a very exciting later half of uh, uh, 2011 um, where I had probably the... Yeah. My, apparently I have a software notification. There we go. Um, later half of the, uh, I had a very exciting later half of 2011. If you ever want to look that up or want to talk to me offline about that, I will sigh very deeply and tell you my sordid story. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, people screw up. Sometimes it's really epic. I'm going to dip back, I, I'm going to go back in my history a little bit. Back to the, my second job out of university. I worked for a company called Orion Multisystems. They made these very pretty compute clusters. This is 12 full computers hacked onto a single PCB. The PCB is this big. I'm not, I'm not actually joking. For those of you who make hardware, the PCB is 48 layers thick. To put this into uh, perspective, most high-end motherboards are 8 to 12 layers thick. This is the equivalent of taking 12, you know, just stacks of uh, motherboards and smushing them into a single uh, uh, PCB. At the time, and I believe to date, this is the largest and most complex uh, PCB that Flextronics has ever done. I believe they also swore at the time when they were manufacturing this that they would never do that again. 
So, when you start looking at something that's literally this big and complex, there's a lot that can go wrong. In fact, there's a lot that can go wrong even in the manufacturing process. In one case, we, had, uh, we were doing bring up on a board, we were doing some testing, and everything was going great. Unbeknownst to us at the time, there was an air pocket in one of the uh, power planes. Guess what happens when you put uh, uh, air near a very um, high temperature uh, power source? Not only did it expand, it exploded. And, at, well, effectively you create an oxygen rich environment in which all you need is a spark. Which, oh hey look, there's a lot of power right there. Go figure. Flames literally shot out the side of the board. <laughs> Needless to say, that one was dead. <laughs> but in that failure, you know, we had spent you know thousands, you know, you know thousands of dollars for that single board. And that one failure, I mean, th there are failures of hardware in small companies, and we were a small company that could have ruined us. Well, thankfully, that one didn't. We died for other reasons, <laughs> but um, you know we didn't. You know it didn't stop anybody. But you know sometimes you end up with a failure or a screw up that is you know in retrospect kind of funny. You know you don't usually see fire coming out of the edge of a board. It's kind of pretty. Really hard to recreate that. <laughs> but. We did a lot of really fantastic things with this particular compute system. It was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we had 12 computers on, uh, on this board, and literally 12 computers. Northbridge, Southbridge, Ethernet, memory, each one of these. I mean, it's, you know, if you look down here, this is a full computer. It's about that big. There are 12 sets of this on the motherboard, along with two Ethernet, uh, or two full Ethernet fa fabrics, and power for all, everything, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't have serial ports or HDMI ports on any of them, except for the head node on that particular board, which you can see is way up there, kind of in the left-hand side, which makes it really problematic when you try to bring things up like Windows. Windows, particularly at this time, this is about 10, 15 years ago, really wants a console or something that it can at least talk to the world with. And if it can't find it, it doesn't work at all. So we had a, a, a trade show up in Seattle at one, uh, um, while we were there that, we, uh, that Microsoft really wanted to show off their, their latest clustering software. And we, we said, yes, we can make it work. And well, we could get it working on the head node really, really, really well. Except trying to get it onto all the other compute nodes was a problem because we couldn't get a, a, a console out. So one weekend, we literally went and created serial consoles for every node on, on a cluster. And when I say a cluster, this is a single board. We had uh, machines that would take uh, now I have to pick six of these, as I do the math in my head, and put them into a single fabric. 72 no or 96 nodes, ultimately. So maybe that is eight of them. Eight of them. It is eight. So we, we had eight of these. So we had 96 computers that we then had to go and hand solder and hand create serial console systems uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the boards to bring this all up. We did it, we took it up, and we were the only company at this particular trade show that had a working cluster with Microsoft. Unfortunately, they were apparently still angry at us because we were a 32-bit processor and not 64-bit. But we at least had the, <laughs> but we were at least up and running. <laughs> so that is the claim to fame on that. And, you know, sometimes just shit happens. And, you know, again, more things that just go wrong. A few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, I actually was uh, working on building some Starship bridges. Why? Because, well, you know, everybody wants a Starship bridge, right? And I was uh, doing some CNC milling, and I 
um, happen to, to miscalculate something, and, you know, chunks of plastic were flying all over the place from the CNC machine because, well, I did something wrong. I learned. I fixed it. I sl mostly slowed my progression d down, and instead of this supposing, uh, supposedly uh, supposed to take me about eight hours to do everything, took me 40 hours <laughs> of standing over a CNC machine because I had to throttle everything down so, uh, so much slower than I had expected. Still, it turned out pretty well. I think I've, ta-da. Not that you can really see that because it's a really dark picture, but it turned out pretty nicely. So I'm running a little bit fast, so maybe, uh, uh, so hopefully uh, you folks in the audience will have some more exciting stories of things going wrong. But um, Thomas Edison was once criticized rather brutally for uh, uh, trying to invent the light bulb because he had tried 10,000 different ways and none of them had worked. And he stared at the, uh, the reporter who was uh, interviewing uh, him at the time and he said, I haven't, found t you know, I haven't failed 10,000 times. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. And in reality, that's what we're all doing. Whether we're working on software, working on hardware, particularly when we start going outside of our immediate comfort zones, we're doing nothing but learning. And uh, when things uh, screw up, when things fail, when we make mistakes, that's not us failing, that's us uh, just ha you know, screwing up effectively. Failure is when you screw up and you don't fix it, you don't learn from it, and you don't do anything about it. So I, I, you know, I actually actively encourage you all, go do something crazy, go do something weird. You know, fail, fail faster. The faster you fail, the better you'll be, the better your projects will be, the better your software will be, the better your hardware will be. Because we, you don't get to be, you know, anywhere in the world if you're not screwing up. So, who else has a story? I've told a bunch. I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure there's somebody in here who's screwed up and willing to admit to it. Ooh, hey. Ooh. Oh, hey. <laughs> oh. You can see the screen. <laughs> Woohoo, we've learned something. <laughs> Oh, here, I'll just back up and show you some of the pictures you couldn't... Oh, well, that one's still dark. Let's see if I can... Oh, you can see the crowd better. You can understand why the Wi-Fi was a mess. Uh, well, that one's still funny. Uh, oh, you can actually see the, the break in the wire a little bit better now. So you can see the molten plastic. And the... Uh, Thankfully, I used a thin enough wire that the wire itself acted as a fuse and burnt itself clean through. <laughs> um, it's a little bit easier to see. Yeah, I should probably lighten these pictures up at some point. Anyway. Come on. Who's got a story? I know there's not a whole lot of people in here, but somebody's got to have a story. You got a story. Yep. I mean, doing things, I mean, you're, you're talking about playing video games at levels that you know you're going to fail at, or, you know, picking on, or taking on fights that you know you can't win, but at least the process, you know, just because you, you're not going to succeed, you know, at least going in, you know you're not going to, or well, probably not going to anyway. Um, but you've learned something just from the process itself. So. <laughs> I was going to say, you should email Stephen Rostad and I about uh, our plans on that. <laughs> but uh, for those of you in, uh, on the recording or whether you uh, uh, could hear that, he, he's suggesting, you know, well, you know, there's System D out there and, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, just 
for, uh, accepted it as a foregone conclusion, although the Gen 2 guys up here in the front would disagree with you on that. Um, as I, I believe you guys are still open RC, right? Yes, we are. And, and they're very proud about being open RC. Oh, they're, they're whatever I want. So I want Sys5. I want Sys5. No, I can, I can still have it. Maybe I need to become a Gen 2 guy. You know, I've ragged on the Gen 2 guys for, God, how many years is it now? 15? <laughs> no, I'm not running Upstart. <laughs> Nobody likes Upstart. I'm sure there's somebody who's going to like email me now and say that they love Upstart. And yeah, well, I was going to say, if you really want to um, go back and look at things, uh, uh, take a look at one of my talks. Linux.com did a write-up on one of my talks years ago from the Ottawa Linux Symposium. There's a, there's a choice quote in one of them. Uh, so I'll let you go look that up and Google that for yourself. But uh, yeah, so you know, take on System D, come up with a new init system, and you know, accept that you know System D is not perfect. Maybe it needs to learn. You know, it needs to have a, a, a different init system to actually go and compete against. I mean, competition is actually a very healthy thing, and the fact that there isn't in the init world right now is actually kind of a problem. I. I will refrain from comment on that one on the uh, advice of people who tell me I shouldn't, you know, quite flame and troll that much. <laughs> so come on, who else is screwed up in the room? Uh, I screwed up working on my bicycle more times than I can count. The nice thing is, uh, if I screw up really bad, I just walk to the bike shop that's like three blocks away and say, fix it. Yes. I mean, it, when it breaks again, I try again, and then just rinse repeat until I start doing it myself. Yeah, I mean, it, it's there's always somebody who's got more expertise in an area than you. Well, almost always somebody who's got more expertise in an area than you. And usually, the people who have more expertise, in your case, the, the bike mechanics, are going to be more than happy to, i.e., <coughs> take your money, uh, <laughs> to fix your bike. You know, at least in the open source world, we're at least nice enough to give advice instead of immediately demanding money. Usually. But, um, yeah, I mean, and, you know, sitting at the feet of somebody else and going, you know, I've screwed up, you know, how do I deal with this? I mean, I, you know, I have, I, there are kernel developers who still ping me about, well, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? Um, mostly in systems administration kind of things because I used to admin kernel.org for about a decade. You know, they all know, you know, mostly how to contact me. <laughs> um, and they know that I know what they're looking for and I'm sometimes faster than trying to read the man page, which usually is a bad sign that the man page needs some updating, but. I always try to ask, what, what did I do wrong? Or like, is there a better approach? Or could I try to yeah. Yeah, is there a better approach? You know, what should I have actually learned from this failure as opposed to that I, you know, screwed up? So, mostly that I invited the Gen 2 guys to this talk and they're not heckling me nearly enough. <laughs> you're tired. No, you're not tired. You're Gen 2 developers. You're, you're compiling something. <laughs> I really do rag on you guys like in every talk I ever do, don't I? That's why you like me? There you go. So who else has failed? Besides, you know, the Gen 2 guys for causing global warming. <laughs> I really am going to do that talk someday. I've been threatening that for years. How Gen 2 has directly caused global warming by causing everybody to recompile everything all the time. Huh? <laughs> what has the polar bear ever done for me? Let's see. Uh, it has caused the creation of plushies that are very cute. And they eat uh, seals. And they help the Inuit stay alive. How's that? Is that enough? <laughs> seals are jerks that need to be eaten. <sighs> well, that, that'll teach the seals for, you know, screwing up and not learning anything, right? I can always end early. I mean, it is the, the last day. 
and the last talk of scale. I'm happy to end early if you guys want. So by all means, thank you for attending. I hope you enjoyed scale. I hope you enjoyed the talks. And if you did, please let uh, the, 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 the volunteers know that you appreciated scale because good Lord, I've been watching them uh, work their asses off all weekend and watching them work their asses off for months to pull this all off. And honestly, this is one of the best conferences I've ever been to, and I go to a lot of conferences. So thank you.